Good morning, church. Uh, I want to welcome you to this uh, video presentation of church. Uh, and so you may want to uh, pause this for just a moment to get your Bible and a pen and pencil. There may be something you want to jot down. So if you do that, and come back, join me, and we'll uh, begin this first video service. Today, of course, a new experience for us uh, as a church family. We're in the process of learning how to be uh, close while we're far apart. So the buzzwords of this day and age is uh, such things as social distancing, uh, staying in place, and uh, sheltering. So in the age of the coronavirus, we've got to pivot to new things. And so a new technology here uh, is what we're attempting to do here for you this morning. Uh, so uh, we will continue to do this, hopefully continue to do this as long as the state and nation uh, gives an order for us to uh, stay in shutdown mode. Uh, so in order to enhance our outreach for Christ and keep us connected, uh, we're doing this uh, video stuff. So I hope you will join us in uh, learning more about digital communications so that we can reach more people and have more of the church family uh, avail themselves of these opportunities. Uh, this last week, a couple days ago, I emailed uh, to everyone I had an email address for uh, about the things we wanted to do in order to keep up uh, uh, contact with one another. And so I hope you got that. I know not all of you did. Some I didn't have an email address for. Some I had the wrong address. Some probably showed up in your junk mail. And so you didn't see it. Uh, so let me just review the contents of that. Uh, so we're all hopefully going to be in the same place. Um, so to keep in touch, like lots of churches, lots of ministries, uh, we're doing this electronically. So what we want to do is encourage you to do a few things, uh, and that is uh, to make sure that you're checking your email, texts you get, probably are checking. I have a few folks that just didn't um, think to check, and so uh, do that. It'll help us keep in touch with one another. Uh, and I encourage you to keep in touch with the folks that you normally interact with at church. So maybe a few more phone calls or couple of more texts to make sure the body of Christ, the network is working uh, in this uh, video age. So uh, I will be contacting you, attempting to, once a week um, by phone. Uh, if you're not home, I'll leave a message. If you don't call me back, I'm going to assume uh, you're healthy, wealthy, and wise. And so um, you needn't call me back, but just to let you know, I will check in. I normally be doing that on uh, Fridays and Saturdays. Uh, I called about uh, a third of you uh, last night. Uh, the good news is that fortunately we're all doing well in relation to the coronavirus. Everybody's healthy. Uh, we do have a couple of folks that we should remember to pray for. Um, uh, uh, let's see, who is uh, Anna Orr. Uh, the doctors are concerned about her. They are suspicious of cancer. And so she has a biopsy uh, coming up here this coming Friday. And certainly we pray the Lord will be uh, gracious and this will be turn out something that's far more manageable than cancer might be. Eleanor uh, Lamunion, uh, we if you had text this last week, you know uh, she was in the hospital, had trouble with speech and uh, a concern about some uh, bleeding on her brain. She is now home, uh, but her speech hasn't returned. But other than that, uh, Sherry says she's healthy and doing fine and planning to go to a speech therapist uh, to uh, try to improve that. So uh, the Lord is uh, working in relation to our prayers. So we'll be using uh, three platforms here. Uh, one is Zoom for uh, our prayer meeting, a video prayer meeting. Uh, we'll be loading this on Facebook and YouTube. So uh, if you're not familiar with those, we'd encourage you to get familiar. 
um, uh, so that you can take advantage of this. Now, I know some um, are kind of uh, phobic about uh, technology, uh, but uh, if you have grandkids, they will be able to help you. Not only that, uh, you'll be better able to keep up with them if you're on Facebook, because they, they live on that stuff. So, it's daunting, we know. If the elders can do this, if I can do this, you can do this. So challenge yourself a little bit in this time uh, to uh, catch up with us uh, via the technology. Uh, secondly, I'd encourage you to stay at the routines of your life. Uh, do what you normally do as best you can uh, to achieve a sense of stability. You know, doing the normal routine things, habits of life, uh, has a way of creating a sense of pattern and habit and stability for us. Spiritually, that means that, uh, you know, stay with it. Stay with your Bible reading, your prayer, your worship time, sharing your faith as the Lord gives you opportunity. Uh, don't let these things disappear in the distraction of the pandemic. Three, finally, I want to encourage you to continue your excellent financial generosity. Uh, one of the things I've been impressed with with this church uh, is your uh, generous spirit. When folks have come in and we've taken a special offering for them, I've been exceedingly impressed with your willingness to be generous with folks. And so we ask that you continue to do that. Uh, as you probably realize, there are a lot of folks that uh, we support as missionaries, and this is a tough time for them. They're experiencing this in a foreign country, and so getting missionaries back to the field, getting missionaries from the field, uh, getting dollars to those missionaries, and so forth is important. So we would encourage you to continue on with what you've been doing with your financial support. You can do that by mailing uh, your uh, gifts and offerings to uh, the church's post office box here in Lyons. It's post office box 222, Lyons, Oregon. Post office box 222, uh, Lyons, Oregon, uh, of course, 97358. So if you'll do that, that will help us pay the light bills and uh, do some maintenance on the church and keep the heat on and all of that uh, practical stuff. So please uh, do that. This morning, I want to consider with you uh, a, a biblical text from James chapter 1, uh, 1 through 8. But before we do, I'm going to ask you to join me in a word of prayer. Father, I uh, take a moment to recognize that uh, we are dependent on you. Certainly this uh, pandemic has shown us how fragile we are. Father, as much as our leaders in our nation and our state uh, are trying to figure out what to do and how to do it, uh, it is obvious that we have all come to the end of ourselves in relation to this thing. And so we ask for you to be merciful, to intervene, Father, to protect uh, people from this uh, horrific plague. And so, Father, as we come to look for a few moments at your word, I ask that uh, we take encouragement from the reassurances that it brings to us. So we thank you and pray that your spirit will open our hearts to your word here. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me read to you from the book of James, and of verse 1 through 8, although primarily I'm going to be focused on verse 2. It says, James, servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like 
a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. I'd like to read to you uh, one of my favorite little stories. And uh, I often have shared this uh, with folks. I enjoy it because it has some impact as to the way uh, I view our, our faith. It says, one day a man brought us a, bot, a stallion and all his friends said, that's good. The next day the stallion ran away and all his friends said, that's bad. Two weeks later, the stallion returned with a herd of mares. His friend said, that's good. The next day, his son broke his shoulder when a stallion threw him off. The friend said, that's bad. The next month, war broke out. Because the boy was injured, he could not go to war. That's good. We're not very good at predicting the future, are we? You remember Y2K? There was a lot of negative thinking about that event. Uh, we held at our church a Y2K party. And uh, as the uh, hour rolled on, uh, nothing happened. Even though there were plenty of people who published books and made prophecies about the denies of America as we knew it, nothing happened. That little story tells me that we ought to be somewhat cautious in listening to every prediction that's out there about the demise of America and about the worst case scenario when it comes to the uh, coronavirus. As you think about your own life story, I will bet, as you rehearsed it, that there have been situations where you thought something was, well, pretty bad, but later turned out to be good. Something uh, you may have thought was going to be wonderful turned out to be a disaster. Life is like that. It is unpredictable. We do not know what the future holds. And so we have to be cautious because we do know that God holds the future. During my college days, I worked uh, in the summers for the U.S. Forest Service in California on a fire crew. The summer of my junior year, the crew and I went to the Angeles National Forest. Now, the Angeles National Forest has no trees. It's just brush, which was in Southern California to flight, uh, fight a very large fire. Uh, and upon arrival at the fire camp, uh, after a, a long journey with no sleep in uh, a rough airplane, as we got there, the fire chief said to us, well, men, you're going to go out on the fire line first thing in the morning. So that means that you're going to have to get up at 3.30, get breakfast, be on the cattle truck, was what they were using to move us to the uh, heli spot where our helicopter was supposed to pick us up, by 4.30. Um, most of the crew hadn't gotten much sleep the night before and wasn't thrilled about this early morning arri arising. The next morning we got our breakfast and we were ready to get on the trucks when the fire chief came by and he said, we're not gonna send you out this morning. We've changed our minds. We're going to send out another hotshot crew in your place. We all uh, grumbled a little bit. Oh, great we all muttered. This thing just got worse. We had to get up in the middle of the night, uh, just as it turns out, to sit around fire camp all day. And besides, we'll miss out on the bonus hazard due pay that we all wanted to earn. As we are sort of grousing about um, our misfortune, a couple of hours later that morning, the fire boss camp came by to report to us that the helicopter that we were supposed to be on to transport us to the fire line had crashed, killing every member on board. Our crew fell eerily silent as we contemplated how close 
we had come to our own demise. What we thought was a bad situation had turned out to be an act of God's grace. It was tragic for some, but fortunate for us. We are not very good at predicting the future. We don't know what's coming, but God does. Our lives are a composition of good, bad news. We can't quickly know which is which. For each of their, us their, in chapters in our stories, our life stories, when clouds roll in and darkness descends, and fortunately there are other chapters where we bask in the sunshine of God's blessing. At present, we find ourselves living in a time of trial. Not only for us, but for the entire world. We live in a time of isolation, of uncertainty and death. At present, we would not consider our stories good, but we must remember that we don't know how this ultimately will turn out. But what we do know is that God is in control of the story, of our story. We may not like this chapter of our lives, we'd like it to be over and soon, but God is in control of the story. And every story in Christ ends with the goodness of God. So we don't have to be panic-stricken when those dark moments and depressive chapters are written. The Apostle James gives us some helpful advice when we're going through these trials in these uncertain times. Verse 1 says that James is writing to the 12 tribes uh, in the dispersion. Now, what has happened is that James was the pastor of the church in, Jer in Jerusalem. And so they are dispersed because they were running for their lives. A persecution broke out. And so James is now writing to this dispersed uh, church that is now far spread over the Roman Empire. And he's writing to encourage them. These church folks are living as aliens in foreign countries. Uh, they are uh, finding jobs hard to come by. Uh, they are finding food scarce and acceptance rare. And so James is writing to a suffering church. Uh, people who are socially distant, people who are spread out and cannot get together as they once did in the church in Jerusalem. Now, I think in light of this, that it's kind of surprising what James says. And if we had read James before, I think we're, we should be a little stunned by what he says. Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Now that's uh, shocking. And if we had read our Bibles many times before, I think we'd be stopping to say, how can James say that? Consider it all joy, really. What does he mean? Uh, and thinking about James' words here, to consider it all joy, and thinking about the context broader of what the scriptures have to say to us uh, about the Lord and who he is, let me suggest to you three things um, that come to my mind as I think about what James says in light of our present circumstances. So just think about these. God is good and loves to redeem our stories for his glory. God is good and loves to redeem our stories for his glory. This is the God that we serve. I reminded the passage in Hebrews, it says, those who come to God must believe that he exists and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God is good and loves to redeem our stories for his glory. Secondly, out of this, that all who know Christ personally know their story ends in victory over sin, pain, and death. And third, 
If we trust God in adversities of life, he will turn them into opportunities for personal growth. If we trust God in adversities of life, he will turn them into opportunities for personal growth. I think James says what he says because he believes that this is the God who rewards those who diligently seek him. Because God is in charge of our stories. He is not only with us in those good times, those shiny chapters in our life, but the dark ones as well. God is in control on the mountaintops and in the valleys of our lives. And he is guaranteed that the end of our stories will be one of victory, glory, and honor. So we endure those bad news chapters because we know the end of the story is good. We consider our trials with joy, not because they are fun, but because our trials in Christ will never be the final verdict. It will not be the way the story ends. The end of our life is always ending in victory. James accepts that the good and bad things happen in a fallen world. I note that James says not if you experience many trials, but when. This side of heaven, trials are part of the normal or unnatural life that God intended for us. The reality of life this side of heaven is that no one on planet Earth gets to live a wrinkle-free life. There are no exemptions from heartache, pain, injustice, and viruses. James tells us that trials are not only painful, but they're plentiful. James puts it this way. He says various trials. They're of all kinds of sizes and shapes. Uh, they are varied. They are many. Uh, and as we all know, that's true. Some trials are physical. Lots of us know that. Lots of prayers go up to heaven for our physical ailments. Some trials are emotional, and life overwhelms us, and we cannot handle it very well. Trials are economic, and some suspect that the long-lasting effect of this situation in which we find ourselves will probably be economic challenge ahead. Some are social and personal, and they often seem, at the time, endless. In our biographies, there will be many chapters touching on the subject of hardship. But this is not a unique story to us. If we look at our heroes of faith in the Old Testament, people like Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Esther, their stories are about God redeeming their stories in order to bring glory to himself. Even the story of Jesus as we come into Holy Week is a story about bad, good news. A.W. Tozer, commenting on all of these heroes of faith, made this startling statement, which I don't like, but I think is true. God hurts a man deeply before he uses him greatly. If you can disprove that statement, please do let me know because I would be happy if it weren't true, but it is. Pain and suffering is often the way that he brings about our spiritual maturity. Now James recasts the idea of trials in terms of what he calls a test of faith. He says, for you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect you may be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. Those are pretty astounding claims. Think of those things. Perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. James points out that God never wastes pain. He controls our life stories and our stories are guaranteed in Christ to end positively. He has a constructive purpose for any trial that we face. We have joy in the bad times 
because we know better times are coming and we are going to be better people for it. This constructive purpose in hard times, as another pastor says, there is no testimony for God without a test. It is as we come through these trials and see how he's made us better. As a pastor, I've often had people come to me and say something like this when they uh, have been through a trial and it's all over and they're looking back and reflecting on their life and they'll say something of, like this. Pastor, I never want to go through this again, but I can tell you it was the best thing that ever happened in my life. God is in the business of redeeming our stories for his glory. So he uses the hard times in our lives to mature us and to perfect us. God is in the business of making us just like Jesus. And he often uses the same experiences Jesus went through to make us like Jesus. I recount for you Hebrews uh, chapter 5, verses 8 to 9. Although he was a son, he, speaking of Jesus, learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Our Heavenly Father will perfect us the same way he perfected his Son, by using the trials to test our faith so we may become perfect and complete, just like Jesus. This coming week we celebrate Easter and it reminds us of how God controls the story of human history. It is a story of God, of good and bad. The Easter tell, story tells us of religious elite who crucified their own Savior. That's bad. The Savior, Jesus Christ, died for their sins and for our sins. That's good. Peter denied the Lord three times. That's bad. Jesus forgave Peter. That's good. Jesus was murdered and hope was lost. That's bad. Jesus rose from the dead. That's very good indeed. The Easter week cautions us about jumping to quick conclusions about the negative events we experience in this life. In Christ, we are told in Romans, all things work together for good because God is in control of our stories. Today, our faith is being tested. We don't know when the test will end. I'd like it to be today. The best minds in the world cannot tell us when this pandemic will be over. In times of trial, we are anxious people. We want it to be own. We want it to be different. We want it to stop. Someone said we are like children at Christmas. Seeing the presents under the tree, we can barely wait till the day arrives that we can get a hold of our presents. The good news is for children that Christmas does come. The good news is that so, one day, our rewards will come. Our Heavenly Father knows the day. It will be when steadfastness has its full effect, and we are made complete, lacking nothing, just like Jesus. So, I encourage you to remember these things as we proceed. God is good, and he loves to redeem our stories for his glory. If we trust God in adversities, he will turn them into opportunities for personal growth. In Christ, all our stories end in glory, honor, and victory. So, brothers and sisters, consider it all joy as we face the coronavirus together. Let's pray. Father, we uh, need to be reminded about our faith. We can get so easily distracted. 
And so, Father, I would pray for myself and for my brothers and sisters that we not forget your word to us, that you have overcome the world. Father, you've not just overcome this trial, but everything that comes in this world. So help us to remember that while all of us may be uncertain about some things, there are some things we can know for sure, that you are God that exists and as a reward of those who diligently seek you. I thank you for that. I thank you for your goodness and your love and for your redemption in Jesus Christ. I thank you. Amen. I want to add a PS. Uh, today is Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week. And so this is kind of a confession. Um, this virus has so preoccupied me that I could hardly believe it Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week. And with this preoccupation, I'm a little disappointed in myself. I have not taken the time that I've done in the past to uh, receive my king afresh. I am a distracted disciple who has forgotten to prepare for his king's arrival. I would encourage you, if that's true for you, that you set aside some time today to get along with God and proclaim your hosannas and offer yourself once again to him, for he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Thank you. Okay.